My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, what if he gave a party and nobody came? After preparing all of the food and cooking it, getting all the punch, sodas, and hors d'oeuvres ready, wouldn't you be upset, angry, and mad if they didn't come to your party? Think of all the money you spent. Think of all the hours of preparation that you put into it. How would you feel? Would you be upset if they gave all kinds of excuses for not coming, even after being told about it in advance? Well, our Gospel reading for today is a parable that Jesus gave. A man was giving a party. The invitations were given. He spent a fortune for this party. All of the cooking, drinks, and perhaps entertainment were made ready. And then came the big moment. He sent out his servants to bring the people in whom he invited to the party. Tell them that the party is ready. Come on in. And then nobody came. One excused himself by saying, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Now the excuse may seem lame as most people would not buy a land sight unseen. Who knows but that he could have even bought the most undesired spot on planet earth. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Another lame excuse or not? Who wouldn't try out the oxen before buying them? It's like a car. Surely you would test drive it before you bought it. A third one offered, I just got married, so I can't come. Now of all the excuses thus far given, this one might seem to be the most excusable one. After all, after the marriage comes the honeymoon. Yet the one who gave the party had given the invitations well in advance. Each one had not given any indication that they wouldn't come to the party when they were orig originally invited. Why would one all of a sudden get married, just when the feast was ready? Most people, again, usually plan these things well in advance. Reading further, we find this out. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Now it seems that the feast that the man had prepared was not of the ordinary size. It was something that was far more spectacular and something far more bigger than anyone could imagine. Still, the hall was not filled. Then the master told his servant, Go into the roads and the country lanes and make them come in, so that my house will be full. Now it seems that the party which was planned was for those who knew the master of the house. Yet now the house was filled with those who knew only about the master of the house, and had accepted his servant's invitation to the feast. It was those who now would have a taste of that which they had never known before. They would partake of the wonderful food and get to know the master. Now they had become the favorite of the master. To those who were formally invited, the master said, I tell you, not one of those men who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. One theologian put the meaning of this parable into these words. The master is Christ, who invites the house of Israel to his feast. Yet they rejected his invitation. So he then invited the second time the Gentiles to his feast, and then sent out a third time for those who were on the fringes. Now this is a plausible explanation of the parable. And while we may like to think purely in theological circles when dealing with the scriptures, there may be a different kind of thinking when it comes to the application of this parable in our own daily living. It is one thing to look at things in a purely theological manner, and it's a different thing to look at things in order to apply them to us today. Christ our Lord took upon himself the form of man, to live as we do on this earth. He came to suffer and to die on the cross for our salvation. When man fell into sin, he inherited the condemnation unto death. In other words, because man sinned, he would die both physically and spiritually. Humankind deserved the pains of hell. And as we found out last week, according to the scriptures, there is a literal heaven and there is a literal hell. We are saved by grace alone, 
not by anything that we can do. If God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, as is stated in 2 Corinthians 5.19, and whom the same apostle declared in Colossians 1.27 that Christ is in you the hope of glory, then why wouldn't one desire to go to the feast that our Lord provides us each Sunday or on his day? In context, let us consider the following passage from Hebrews 10 verses 23 and 24. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith, not wavering, for he is faithful that promised. As we see in our gospel reading, those people who supposedly knew the master intimately did not respond to the master's invitation to his feast. They made up excuses, and there are many today who claim to be Christians and who claim to be intimate with Jesus Christ, but for who, one reason or another, don't want to attend the feasts which our Lord has prepared for us. For that which is the divine service is just that, a feast. If we are holding fast in the faith of Jesus Christ, our desire will be with, to be with him on his day. Let us then as Christians not waver in our commitment to our Lord Jesus Christ. We do this when we go to learn what the Lord would want us to learn from his word in his house. Going further in Hebrews chapter 10 we find out in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It is where we can get our spiritual batteries recharged. It is where we can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. It is where we are fed the word of God and partake of his forgiveness in holy communion. It's a time to be intimate with our Lord and Savior in his house. For those who are truly his desire to be in church on Sunday, which is the Lord's day, to receive his blessings in both word and sacrament. But so often the temptation comes to do things on Sunday. We give excuses as to why we can't go to church. I'll miss the big Super Bowl game. I have to prepare for company coming over. I can only sleep in on Sunday. I need to relax and Sunday is my only day off. And sometimes when the time comes for us to go to church, this is also the time that Satan throws in some wrenches. Something happens at the time we get ready. The telephone rings, the children act up, or we forgot to get enough gas for the car. A myriad of things can pop up. For those who do make it to church, they are the ones who are rewarded spiritually and will be fed. For there we learn of the Lord in His Word. Wonderful words of life, the Word which can direct our lives in a world of uncertainty in a world where there seems to be no absolute truth that one can turn to. The Word is what we can rely on. It is one that we can apply to our lives each and every day. It is the Word that we can fully trust when the world around us is turning upside down. As the psalmist writes in Psalm 91 two, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress my God, in Him will I trust. It is in the divine service that we can draw near in an intimate way to the Lord with those of like mind who desire the same things. We are encouraged by our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus to live for our Lord and to serve Him. We are reminded to confess our sins before the Lord each day and that as we do we hear the words of absolution. We are assured of the forgiveness of our sins if we confess and repent of them. We learn to thank him for his blessings and for his mercy upon us. We praise him with hallelujahs and we confess our faith and beliefs in the Apostles Creed and also in the Nicene Creed. We then hear his words in both scripture and in the homily. We lift up our hearts to him in song and prayer and prepare ourselves for the Holy Communion. 
when we, we receive this gift we are reminded of the great sacrifice that he gave to us and we leave his table with gratitude and in great joy knowing that our sins are forgiven us we again praise him and then we receive his benediction over us so that we can go and do what he has shown us to do in our lives through his word and be witnesses to others of our Lord Jesus Christ this then brings us to what the master of the feast in today's lesson tells his servants I tell you not one of those men who are invited will get a taste of my banquet one wonders what this particular part can refer to. If you follow the theological approach, this particular verse would mean that Jesus warning the Jews of their refusal to accept God's invitation would result in their rejection and the inclusion of the Gentiles instead. But as I stated before, we are thinking a little bit outside of the theological box and are, are focusing on the application part. You see, we are to live a holy, godly life outside of the church. If our hearts and minds and souls are not with the Lord, then we are the ones that the Lord will reject at the last day. A couple of scriptures will explain what I'm talking about. The first was written to the Laodiceans, found in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write this these are the words of the Amen the faithful and the true witness the ruler of God's creation I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot I wish that you were either one or the other so because you are lukewarm neither hot nor cold I am about to spit you out of my mouth now the King James Version has words that are far harsher than in the NIV. It says, I will spew you out. Harsh words, but one which we as Christians need to take seriously. How are we living the Christian life? Are we reflecting Christ in us, the hope of glory? If not, we need to repent. We need to bring our lives into conformity with God's Word. For those who claim to be Christians, but go to church for other reasons, God's holy word says this in Matthew 7 verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and perform many miracles? Lastly, if we are to serve our Master, the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be like the servants and do what Christ bids us to do in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. He said to them, Go into all of the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. We are to be witnesses of the salvation that the Lord God, in His mercy and grace, gave to us. We are to share the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ to a spiritually dying world, so that they can, like we, have the opportunity to come in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, and receive forgiveness for their sins, and be saved from sin, death, and hell. We go to church because we are committed to the Savior who in love for us paid for our salvation. We go to church because we want to serve Him. We go to church because our hearts are refreshed by Him when we partake in spirit and in truth. Our hearts are filled with joy when we partake of the sacrament because of the forgiveness that He provides. In the divine service, our lips speak with thanksgiving and adoration to the One for the wondrous things that He has and will do for us. In the divine services, our desire to live for Him should grow, and our desire to speak about Him and to others should abound. May the Lord Jesus Christ grant this to us all. <laughs>